Welcome to Emma Labs Live, a podcast by Neptune AI. We host in-depth discussions where machine learning practitioners answer questions from other practitioners about one subject related to production machine learning and MLOps. Tune in to get real-life stories, dirty hacks, and pragmatic workarounds from ML people in the trenches. This is Emma Lops Live. I'm Sabine, your host, joined as always by my co-host, Steven. Hey, Steven. So we are joined today by our esteemed guest, Andy McMahon, and our topic will be your first MLOps system. What does good look like? So Andy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you just fine. Perfect. So Andy, you have uh, an educational background in some interesting stuff. Um, <laughs> Master of Science in Theory and Simulation of Materials and a PhD in Physics. And uh, then you got more into the machine learning side of things. You have a bunch of experience uh, with data science, ML engineering. Currently, you're the machine learning engineering lead at NatWest Group, is that yep. right? Yep. Yeah, banking and insurance holding company. You've also published a book titled Machine Learning Engineering with Python, and you're doing a podcast called AI Write Podcast. So is there like anything you're not doing in the space of uh, sleeping, machine learning? I think <laughs> Sleep, sleeping <laughs> is the main one. Yep. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, we do hope you <laughs> get to rest now and then. <laughs> okay, so this is an interactive Q&A session. So we have some questions prepared for Andy, but this is also a fully interactive Q&A session. So if you're here in the call present with us, you can raise your hand here in Zoom. We will unmute you and you can just go ahead and ask your question. Uh, you can also type in chat and we will pick up your question from there. So to warm you up, Andy, uh, how would you explain to us uh, MLOP systems in one minute, we will time you. So to me, uh, MLOps systems are software solutions that basically allow you to do good operational practices for machine learning products. So what that means in a sense is building ML solutions that are reusable, scalable, reproducible. So contained within that are several different sub practices, some of which are very important and particular to machine learning software solutions like model monitoring, how do you know your machine learning model is performing at the appropriate performance criteria? How are you retraining? So retraining systems are part of that. How do you trigger retraining? How often are you retraining? Are you scheduling it, et cetera? You then also have model management practices. So you need to track and manage the metadata associated with your model artifacts and make sure that that is clearly labeled and articulated. And then all of that has to come together in a sustainable set of practices and processes that have a very clear route to life within it so that you can take machine learning models from ideation through to production. And that to me is MLOps systems. That was just a few seconds over one minute and it was very nicely encapsulated. Very happy. So <laughs> nicely done. <laughs> all right, Stephen, over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for sharing that. And I would so like to preface with uh trying to understand what does good look like? Because I think it's it's one of the key things we emphasize in, in the title. So what does a good MLOps system, especially when you're trying to build it for the first time, what does this sort of system look like? And you know, what does it take to set it up? Let's start from there. Yeah, good. So I think what's really important for, for this is making sure that it makes your life easier. So the worst thing we can do as a community is build MLOps systems and solutions because we feel we have to, right? So just because right. it's the latest fad or the latest trend, I should incorporate MLOps tools or build my own MLOps processes in place. That's that's not true. You need to understand that we are fundamentally solving a particular set of problems that are problems, right? So I'd say what right. good looks like is when you feel that your MLOps systems and solutions are making your life as a data scientist or an ML engineer easier, and we'll, we'll go through, I suppose, through the chat, 
the iterations that that can go through and how you can start small and scale up. But fundamentally for me, you know you're doing this well if it's making your life easier. And that can, that can manifest in multiple ways, right, uh, which we can dive into. But it could just be your developer experience is easier, but also you see uptick in things like uh, the Dora metrics from the DevOps world. So is your time to, to live reducing? Is the number of failed deployments reducing? Is the uh, general performance improving? So, so these things are not just making your lives easier, but also, also your customers' lives easier. So, so good to me looks like it's something that helps you do ML more repeatably and scalably, but also ultimately impacts your customers in a positive way. Right. And what does it take to set up a good system? Yeah. At a high so, level, anyways. <laughs> at a high level, yeah, we'll, we'll dive into it. So, so I think you need to you need to break down break down the problem into its constituent parts. And I mean, I mentioned some of the, some of them before, but your first system should always be, I think, relatively rudimentary. I'm a huge believer in bootstrapping your capability, as I call it. And I've spoken about this in the past. So you shouldn't go into this problem thinking, I want to solve all of those pieces I mentioned at the top of the call in one go, because you'll do that for five years. And by that time, your business problems disappeared, your customer base is gone. So it is very important that you, you pick what's the most pressing pain point for me as a group, as a team, as a data scientist, as an organization, and chase that first. So your initial MLOps systems, in my view, should always be ones that do the, the very basics in terms of model management and experiment tracking first. So mm -hmm. you need to have some way of understanding the experiments you've run when you're, you're building the model. So there's tons of tools that do this, and we can go into specific tools later, but you need to really have a way of tracking the different experiments you've got. You then need to have a way of tracking, as I mentioned before, the, the model artifacts you generate through those processes. So you don't just want to run a thousand experiments trying different hyperparameters. You also need to say, this is the best model. How do I store it somewhere and tag it so I can use it later? You then need to have a way of monitoring your ML solution. So you need to start thinking, how do I know when the performance is drifting? What does performance drift look like for me? And that can be very basic again. It could be very much, you define one performance metric that you think is the most important. You then define some scheduled thing that goes and pulls relevant data, runs a simple query on it, and then outputs to, to a file somewhere, right? That, that's you still doing ML ops. It's not the most sophisticated approach in the world, but it is good enough for that version zero. And then I think you need to fundamentally just think as well, what are the practices you need to develop to keep building on top of that? So do you have the right software engineering capability in your team? Do you have the mm -hmm. right understanding of integration points, et cetera, et cetera? So, so I think start small and inter iterate up, I would say. Uh, and again, you should see the uptick in those, those different metrics that, that you've hopefully typified at the beginning of your, of your journey. Right. Is there any clear difference between me talking about an ML system and an ML ops system? Because it, yeah. It, it, yeah, because the way I think Great. about maybe th starting from like the bottom is I just want mm -hmm. to deploy something out there. I'm not thinking about experiment tracking and nothing. When it, I just want to put out a model out there, but is it, is it just, maybe you can give that clear distinction. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a really good question, actually. So you can take machine learning models through to production or build a solution and think you're not doing ML ops, but realistically you're just doing ML ops very badly. So, so what I mean by that right. is you build your model, you wrap up in a pipeline, you run that pipeline mm -hmm. in some way. If you don't have any tracking of your experiments, any tracking of the model artifacts, if you're not monitoring the end result, you just kind of, you're, you're almost not doing ML ops, but the ML ops you're doing is just the most basic possible, which is where I assume everything operationally is fine. Right. <laughs> so it's like ML ops version 0.00. .00. So I think it is important that there's some element of this from the ground up. So any ML solution to my mind has to have some element of ML ops in it. Now, whether you disentangle that into a different system is an interesting question. So ML ops to me is a bit more general than just, I know as we're focusing on systems tonight, but it's also a set of holistic practices and a way of viewing the world, right? So it's like right. DevOps was for software engineering. It's just about understanding that the solution you're building won't, won't just kind of be built and then you can forget about it. It's a living, breathing thing. And that's very right. particular in, in ML and uh, machine learning, obviously, where we have retraining requirements, et cetera. So you could separate it in different systems and have it kind of hook in in multiple places to your ML solution. But to me, ML ops practices 
should be embedded within what you're doing as, a, as an ML practitioner anyway. And then it's just a question for that particular organization, team, et cetera, whether it's separate systems or it's just embedded within the tools you're using. I think we have that clear distinction now. And then you spoke about something about the, the very basic version 0.00. .00. And you know, how would you say differentiates the very basic V0 to V1? And it's obviously we're thinking about scale, but even yeah. more so, how can we start thinking about that? We are at V0, how is it different from moving to V1, V2, and then start iterating going forward, yes? Yeah, you're always any problem you're solving, right? You're going to optimize in certain dimensions versus other ones. You only have right. finite time, energy, effort to expend. So to my mind, version zero is about maybe dropping down on repeatability, scalability in a sense, and just optimizing for understanding the, sound, the basic principles and really going through the process end to end. So I often think that in any team I've built up or worked in, the first problem we go through, all of you probably on the call can, can uh, uh, sympathize with this. It's, it's not great when I look back, but the point was to go through that process the first time. So in ML ops, what that means is just, you know, doing some sort of basic exporting of your models to somewhere and just solving the problem in the in any sort of way. So again, it could be very rudimentary, but is it simply the case of the name of your pickle or job lib file tells you the model version, right? That can be very much the version zero because what you're optimizing the first time is what is the entire end-to-end -end process look like? And then for me, version one, two, three, et cetera, is about starting to move the other way and upping the quality, repeatability, scalability. And it's it's sort of up to you and your particular use case which you optimize first. But I think um, just anything you can do to make it as simple as possible will help in all, all these dimensions. So if, if the code you're building is modular, if the systems you're building reference good architecture patterns, um, if everything's quite quite distinct and embodies separation of concerns, that's, that's often a, a, a good sign. And once you get to the most sort of sophisticated, so version N, where N is quite large, <laughs> I'd say you're very much at the case where Scaling from one use case to a thousand use cases shouldn't scare you too much. There's some problems maybe to work out there. Maybe the, the bill you'll have to fit for the infrastructure is concerning you, but you know that the processes and tool set you've put in place is one that can scale that way. And that's the sort of stage I think, I think I'm at in, in, in that West really is we've, we've built out our MLOps capabilities that way. So, so I'd say it's about, it's about that. Version zero is about optimizing, just understanding the process, building out the mm -hmm. initial principles, learning a lot. Version one, two, three is about iterating on that and building something much more repeatable. Right. Thanks for th th that answer. And I think one thing this podcast focuses a lot on is on uh, the reasonable scale teams. And in the second episode, we have this call with uh, uh, Jacopo. And I think mm. it was similar to it's a lot of things he discussed about building, um, just starting small to put, put out something there that solves a problem and iterating going forward. But in your opinion, we're looking at a team that say six people, maybe two data scientists, three data scientists, one ops engineer, and then they have just say three, four, or a handful of models of production. They are building an AI first startup, right? You know, what advice would you have for such team? Just thinking about that problem first, and then thinking about what components they need to start setting up first, just to ensure that they are showing that immediate ROI before they start thinking about, oh, I want to build a bigger platform and house lots of models and scale up. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I was, I was actually in a similar scenario a few years ago so when i started out right. i was in a, a scale up of like 12 people i was head of data science and machine learning which meant i was in charge of just myself because <laughs> i was the only data scientist so right very similar scenario had very resource constrained had a few software engineers who would help so i think in that scenario you have to really think how to not reinvent the wheel so i mentioned doing things in a very rudimentary mm. way right but thankfully now there's so many tools packages out there that you can do things in a rudimentary way in terms of you've maybe not solved all of the scaling issues you know you'll come up against, but you can at least leverage what's out there. So there's lots of great packages um, in, in Python. There's lots of great tools that have are open source or have sort of freemium models mm -hmm. where you can at least get started. I'd recommend doing your research and understanding which of these can you leverage and which of these can you use in a way that means you build a minimal set of work around that really. Leverage it as much as possible. Harking back to some of the stuff we've already mentioned, keep it simple as well. So 
I believe this for ML model development as well, always start with the simplest case. Like if you can solve it with a linear regression, don't go to a neural network. The same thing applies to ML ops systems. Right. If you can solve it from a cron job and a Python script, do a cron job and a Python script first, and then start probing it, understanding in the later iterations, why would that fall down? Or oh, cron's not very stable. It's got some issues, so I should go this way, maybe move towards more sophisticated orchestration pieces or whatever the particular part of the problem you want to go after is. Um, one thing that is not covered there is I think any ML team at that scale has to really focus on data quality up front because that's very intimately tied to the ML ops challenge, right? So if you have very poor data quality, no matter how good your ML engineers and your AI engineers your, your performance is going to be all over the place. You're going to be triggering incidents. You're going to be in retraining and debugging that model all the time. And that's right. just not something that you can do when you're that small. You can't absorb all your time doing doing these sort of instant instant management issues. So, so I think um, making sure the data quality is really good up front is also an important one that, that would say applies at any scale, but particularly when you're small and you're very resource constrained. I would love to zoom into your early experience a little bit, the one you talked about, um, I mm. think before NatWest. And, you know, what's typical, your typical baseline tool stack? You know, you're, you're thinking about this problem firsthand, and then you just want to put a few things together. What are those components you really prioritize just at, at, the, general, at the general level? Maybe they are not problem dependent, because I assume that if you think about this, you want to just push that model into production. Yeah. But beyond that, is there are there like hidden blind spots that teams would often miss when thinking about the components they need to put together for their first ML system, ML ops systems? Yeah, good question. So I, I think we can often in this field get very attracted by the shiniest tools that seem to right. kind of either have the slickest videos or really cool demos and cool UIs. So. So that sometimes belies the importance of more fundamental things like you're mentioning. So, so for me, one huge thing that I always come up against and I always think is fundamentally important is orchestration. Right. So if you have a very clean orchestration layer, a very simplified orchestration layer, and Apache Airflow in particular is amazing for this. And in my book, I talk about managed workflows with Apache Airflow, the, the AWS managed service for this. If you have that orchestration layer in place and you can schedule your pipelines and create the processes that will then trigger other processes, you can then start building very sophisticated things very quickly. So right. even if you don't have a tool that, you know, has amazing bias or explainability tool set mm -hmm. or an amazing model monitoring capability, you can do what I mentioned before and have the basic Python script running, but something like Airflow, a really good orchestration layer means that you know you're still doing that from a very solid foundation and solid base. And then eventually you can swap out the simple Python script for the very fancy ML tool. So I think my, my baseline tool stack is solve your orchestration problem. Solve for me, almost the, the other two I mentioned, the, the model management and model monitoring problem is really important. And again, just start small, do that from simple Python scripts first. But a very important one that is a blind spot, I think, is how complex it is to do model management. So things right. like MLflow, Comet, um, lots of other tools, they are solving a very acute problem. So the quicker you can use something like that, I think you'll, you'll find that it, it makes your life a lot easier. I'd almost chase right. after model management before I would monitoring. It's far easier for me to imagine how to code up some monitoring logic in vanilla Python than it is to build um, a model management piece of software. That, that's a very complex problem. So in the previous teams I worked in, uh, that was always a challenge for us was we didn't have a tool necessarily off the shelf ready for us. So we spent a lot of time building these horrible JSONs that <laughs> tracked where, where our model right. artifacts were and what data we used for things. Um, so, so I'd say if you can get orchestration, then model management sorted, everything else you can do in the first instance with quite vanilla Python uh, is, is my feeling. And then you can build on that as much as you need to. Right. Thanks for sharing that. And I think the reality of most teams is that maybe they hire like one data scientist or, you know, an ML engineer to come and build the entire, you know, the full system. And then you have, we have, we have this argument in the community where, you know, platforms are not enough, right? You have platforms that claim to be able to do the end, solve the end-to-end -end problem and, and so forth. And then you find that inflexibility. Do you have any argument against using your plat using like buying platforms as a system or, or something like that, especially for early stage teams? Yeah, I, I love this question because it's, it's the perennial debate. And I think it relates to what I said about the, sh the shiny new tool 
right. fixation we sometimes have. I think tools, platforms, SaaS, PaaS, all, all of these solutions will only help if you know what you're doing in the first place, right? If you right. if you subscribe to a silver bullet methodology where you think, you know what, I'm just, I buy this thing, I spend a million dollars or from a much smaller company, you know, a few thousand dollars or whatever, I'm going to buy this tool that's going to solve things. You'll just find that you're you're facing the same challenges, but now in front of a shiny UI and you're burning mm-hmm. through lots of cash. So back to the point we, we mentioned before, I would much rather teams went through building up what they can sort of themselves, the exception maybe being the orchestration piece, model management piece, but there's lots of open source tools that do this, right? There's lots of open source tools that that are able to, to help you with those things. So, so I would say, see what you can get with open source tooling. There's also great open source tooling for generally building ML and ML ops pipelines as well. If you can get to a stage where you're like, actually there's an acute need for something else, then invest the money. But if you, if you put the, the, the cart before the horse, as it were, you'll, you'll just you'll just burn a lot of money and be very disappointed because you've not solved the fundamental problem. And the fundamental problems are often more process specific and architecture design specific. They're not really what's the best tool because you can always spend more money on tools, but if you don't stick them together properly, you're, you're going to run into trouble, I think. Yeah, and uh, speaking about the processes, you know, what are some practices that you think would enable these these early stage teams like think about these systems properly and properly implement them because I watched one of your podcasts with the MLOps community and then you talked about the the chasm between idea and production and then in the middle there you have this this bridge this gap that needs to be filled but I think beyond just the tool in which you've spoken about there are also some practices that can make things work some like culture 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 you can build as, as a team especially thinking about systems systems properly what are those co- um, those practices that you think that teams should start thinking about at the early stage when thinking about systems yeah i'm, I'm glad someone watched that podcast um so <laughs> there was um the thing that i often come back to is i call it the four p's so people process pattern and products right so just covering right. them very quickly and i think you can never be too early thinking about these so on the people front and we alluded to this earlier we should always avoid thinking there's a unicorn person out there who can do everything we need. We need hybrid teams, blended teams that have very complementary capabilities. And you can do that at any scale. As long as you have two or even three people, you can still get that blend of, you know, to have the software uh, engineering knowledge, the ML knowledge, and then something maybe in the middle or a translation layer towards the business, et cetera. But pe- people such an important part of that. Who are the people you have? Do they complement each other and work well together? Product um, is about just really what this whole podcast is about, ensuring you understand that you're building intense systems that eventually impact customers. Right. How are you going to think about that differently from just a normal piece of prototype code? Well, you understand that products, people expect them to work. So that implies that you should be testing a lot. Do you have testing processes in place? Are you already thinking right. about unit testing, integration testing, regression testing? If you're not, start thinking about them because that's the only way to build scalable and usable product. Um, and then also think about the, the user experience. So the user in this case might not be an actual person, but might be another system. Mm-hmm. So do they have a clear interface and clear contract to consume from? And it could be something as simple as, does the other system have access to the same S3 bucket where I dump my results? That That's the sort of thing you sometimes have to think about in that product space. But then to your particular question around uh, process and patterns, which I think is, is really linked. So Patterns for me is about are you using really well-known architecture patterns or at least ones that make sense? Are you using microservice architectures? Are you using uh, architectures that are already there and used by some of the best companies out there? And then on the process side, do you have clear development guardrails? Do you know how to develop high-quality codes? Do you at least know how you'll improve the quality of your codes? Can you do anything you can to automate? So the earlier you can embed CI CD practices. So I think anything, GitHub Actions is a great example, Jenkins, all of these other tools for having CI CD servers in place means that that process can go faster and faster. So, so I think the earlier you think about all of these things together, you'll start doing the right things that then put you in place for the future. When you challenge, right. you're challenged more on issues like massive scale, a structure of things like accounts, security, networking, etc. These can come a bit later, but that, that those four P's for me are the fundamentals that you should always think about for any 
team really, but it's especially pertinent right. to ML and ML ops teams. I think that people pattern process, process and product viewpoints. I think if you if you speak to teams about this, most teams would agree that it's really hard, like just linking these four P's together and uh, and just trying to coordinate around like the people, the process, the products, and and the patterns itself. You know, how do you think that teams can appropriately achieve this? And as a good follow up question as well, so that is. Who should I hire first to build up that build up that system? That my first MLOps system. Should I hire a data scientist or an MLOps engineer or an ML engineer or stuff like that? Yeah. Good. So in terms of who you should who you should hire first, the the challenge is there. It's a kind of trick question. If you're hiring one person, you're already in unicorn thinking, which I, <laughs> I think we should avoid. Right. So say you're hiring two yeah. people, which I would always recommend, sort of minimum viable team at least. I think you need someone with a good data engineering mindset, because I mentioned data is super important. Mm -hmm. And then right. it could be a data scientist, ML engineer, MLOps engineer, it doesn't matter what they call themselves. I think someone that complements that data knowledge quite strongly with the knowledge of pipelining, for example. So how do you build ML pipelines? How do you build MLOps pipelines? By which we mean all the things we mentioned before something that runs and does some monitoring, something that checks what model version to build. But that, that will require a few basic things. So they'll need to understand models, maybe even build those models mm -hmm. or use off-the-shelf models. So even if it's an ML engineer, but they're, they're reusing hugging face models, that's absolutely fine as well. But it needs to be someone who understands models because how else can you build the monitoring logic behind it uh, and understand what you're, what you're doing with model artifact management. But they also need to have enough software engineering capability that they can they can start building these systems that are robust and reliable. And that's that's the right. whole point of ops and ML ops, right? Is mm -hmm. you're not just doing a flash in the pan, you're building something that has to work again and again and again. So you really need that, that software engineering capability there as well. So I think how can they coordinate that is it's always a challenge, right? Um, but I think splitting it out into those four P's helps me rationalize it often. I always break down the problem. So from the people side, we've just we've just discussed that. We've got the complementary capabilities that, that cover off the key things. Patterns, again, leverage what's out there. Don't reinvent the wheel. AWS have their architecture lens framework, I think it's called, AWS lens, where they publish a lot of really well-detailed architectures. And even if you're not on AWS, you can at least see them and see the different components, how they interact in that, together. So that, that kind of ticks off patterns. And then Product is really the end goal, constantly iterating towards the business goal, but just always thinking about reliability and robustness. So that, that just breeds testing. And then and then yeah, in terms of in terms of process, it's it's back to that point about starting small and iterating. So go through the first cycle, constantly iterate, where can you improve? And a lot of those problems will not be new problems. They will be problems solved in software engineering. So leverage right. the software development, software engineering ecosystem as well, I would say. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for, for sharing that. I don't think we have any question from the community yet. So I'll go on with uh, another question for we have predefined. And this is something that is quite popular in the MLS community. And the saying is like to keep the first model simple, or you should try to get infrastructure right, especially when you're trying to you know, deploy uh, your first model or just deploy your first iteration, pushing it out there. You know, can you elaborate on something like this, uh, this particular statement? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I 100% agree with this you should you should always start simple and iterate up so so the, the key difference that as i maybe alluded to earlier between just doing some research-based data science or machine learning versus building a, a product with ml ops at its core is that you, you are thinking about it as something that has to work again and again and again so a simple sklr model that does some regression right so you could you could take one of the you know the boston housing data set that's a very simple thing, loads of tutorials on that. Building that ML model is really easy. What is difficult is if you start saying something like, and this can be particular to the business use case, but how am I going to serve a request to score with that across 50,000 or 100,000 users? Right. How am I going to run that maybe as a batch or maybe as a, as a live microservice that can be requested via API? So I think all of that might be flavored by the business you're operating in. So if right. you know you're supporting a customer facing web application, you're maybe going to naturally go down the REST API microservices route. If you're servicing a very large organization, there's a lot of overnight processes like we often do, 
you're maybe thinking more in a batch way and thinking about using far more scalable technologies like like Spark, et cetera. So just mapping out what your business challenges are going to be, then it automatically starts helping you make architecture and design decisions. And then the, the model piece becomes, again, something that you can always iterate on, but fundamentally is probably relatively simple, sorry, compared to these, mm -hmm. these other choices you've had to make. So then you start thinking, right, how do I set that up in a minimum viable product fashion? How do I stick it all together back to how do I orchestrate it and make sure that it's all it's all running at the right time, et cetera. So, so I definitely I agree with that. And I think always draw back to the, the business problem you're trying to solve. Um, and that also drives your operational considerations. So what ML ops looks like for you. So again, if you're running a big batch process every night, do you really need some sort of complicated live streaming of um, metrics for your model? No, that's overkill. You maybe just need, right. again, a nightly report that runs just after your batch prediction. If you're doing very scalable customer facing application, maybe you do need some more real time metrics and you maybe also need to resurrect and be aware of some of the metrics that are just classic from devops you know is, who's the memory of the cpu utilization all of these things and not just what's the recall of my model and then, and then another challenge that just this has came to mind i think is important as well that comes from the business problem is you'll also be able to put constraints on those processes in a different way so something i've came up a, across quite a lot is the business, once they understand what you're trying to do with MLOps, will often say, right, I want to know how the model's doing every single day. And I'll say, right, how often can I get the truth data for this model? And they'll say every month. <laughs> so automatically, there's a kind of, there's a disconnect between the business, the technology, and how it's all implementing together. So just always drawing back to the business problem really helps kind of hone, hone that in a bit and understand what choices you need to make. Awesome. And curious, uh, are there any misconceptions in the MLOps community about MLOps systems that you don't agree with? Let's trash it out here. <laughs> or oh, any that I don't agree with. The tooling obsession annoys me a bit. Right. So <laughs> I, I think we, we do forget as a community the importance of just good design, good processes, and good software development techniques. We, we often get obsessed about the latest demos and the latest big announcements. And I, I do it as well, right? I'll sign up to about 10 webinars that I'll never attend on all these different <laughs> technologies because there's a new release or a new version. Right. But I think we often forget just how relatively simple the problem we're trying to solve in MLOps is. To my mind, there's only a few different pipelines you're building. You're building your training pipeline to retrain the model. You're building the inference pipeline to bring out the results. And then you're building an MLOps pipeline to do the other bits. And that, that's it fundamentally. So I think I do dislike sometimes how we will oversell the importance of a specific tool choice. You should very be, you should very much be comfortable to swap out tools as you progress through your journey, um, as they solve slightly different flavors of the problem. So your model management right. software, you start with the open source version, and then you say, actually, I want the, the benefit of being supported at an enterprise level. So I'll switch to a paid model with this provider. But it should not fundamentally change the design you have. If your design is tightly coupled to your tool choice, you've, you've made a massive error, I think, because it should really be a swap out. You're just doing a different API call or you're just writing to a different location. You shouldn't be so tied to a product that you suffer from, from lock-in, which is one of the other dangers you can have as well, um, either with cloud providers or with specific tools. You can, you can just become so wedded to it that when you have to change because it's... <laughs> The companies went bust or the tools no longer available mm -hmm. or there's major upgrades you you kind of you have to fix so much technical debt but i think that's the big bugbear for me is is the obsession with tooling i may be being too harsh there's a lot of people i know who work in the community on really amazing tools and there are amazing tools out there especially in the open source community but i just think as practitioners trying to build these solutions for organizations we shouldn't just think there's a silver bullet out there. We really need to bring it back to basics. What are the processes we need to develop? How are we making sure they're robust and monitored and we have good metrics for their performance and then just work against that. Awesome. So I, we have a question from the MLOps community and this person says he's trying to, I'm, I'm working towards building a restaurant recommendation system that provides restaurant based uh, uh, base, uh, that provides the restaurant sorry based on similarity between two people's tastes. I'm planning to deploy it as a web app. You know how should I proceed towards this, knowing that I'll 
be scaling this to 50 or more users? And then how does MLOps come into this particular scenario? Should I repeat or? No, no, that's good. That's good. Okay. I think okay. I got it. Thanks, Steve. So, so it sounds like this person is thinking of a very particular use case, which, which is great for bringing this to life. So if you're building a web application that's going to have 50 or 50,000 users, and you have to run this ML process in the background, this recommendation engine, what's important to my mind at the beginning is not putting all that together in your head because you'll be a bit overwhelmed and you'll probably try and solve it all at the one time and create some spaghetti code or something that's that's not very modular. If you separate out all those pieces, you can start breaking down the problem and understanding how to solve each one. So the front end, right? How are you going to scale the front end to 50,000 users? This is done all the time. So look online, see how that's done for general web applications. That's not something new. You know, you have the, the front end system, you have the application database that stores the right data needed to run the actual the actual web interface. Think about that user experience, get good UX design in place if possible. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of a solved problem, but that's the first piece. That's only the entry point to the rest of the solution. You then have to run your recommendation engine sort of updates, your retraining, your, your rerunning. And I'm not a recommendation engine expert at all. So I'll kind of just assume that's a black box in a sense. But you fundamentally have this process that you need to run at a very large scale that can often be very compute intensive. So put that on one side, how do you how do you solve that problem? And how often are you going to run those updates? Do you have the infrastructure you need in place? Do you need to think about things like auto scaling for particularly chunky or compute updates, et cetera? Do you need to think about moving to the cloud in order to, to service that, these sorts of questions? But I think you think about that recommendation engine update as its own process and separate that out as well. You then have the interaction between the two. So how, and this is something I love talking about is interfaces and contracts. So what's the contract going to be between your front end mm -hmm. and your recommendation engine? Is it a direct API call to some sort of basic Flask app or something else that just surfaces the results of the recommendation engine? Is it going to be something a bit more complex? Is it actually going to be that the recommendation engine can work in a batch offline mode and the, the web application just needs to pick up the results from, from mm -hmm. some, some S3 bucket or other, other location. Um, and then where MLOps comes into it really is in making sure all that hangs together from, from the ML point of view. So the recommendation engine, how do you know that's performant? How are you going to check in on the, the status of that? And then what actions are you going to take based on it? That's your model monitoring process. Mm -hmm. How often are you going to run that as well? If it's a nightly batch process, do you run the MLOps pipeline every night as well to check the monitoring performance? Or do you run that in a, a lot less frequent cadence? How do you manage the, the actual ver versions of the recommendation engine as well? Because you might want to do rollbacks if something goes wrong. So right. you start thinking about that as well. Um, and then finally, I think in this scenario, orchestration comes in through, again, that decision about, is it a dynamic request that triggers an ML process? In which case you're thinking about event-driven architectures, things like Kafka, mm -hmm. um, PubSub architectures, or is it actually, again, it's it's really about retrieving results on the back of a user request that's on a batch a batch kind of schedule, in which case you could do a Chrome job or some other scheduler or, or go back to Apache Airflow, which I mentioned earlier. So I, I think I think the key thing is breaking it down into those constituent parts and then working out how you'd solve each of those problems individually. And then which are the most pressing problems you're not sure how to solve, go and get the resource and help you need to understand that. So for me, the bit I would be less comfortable in is the front end. I have no idea. I have no UX skills, no understanding how to build a good front end at all. So I would right. need help to do that. The other pieces I probably know. And MLOps is really about managing that back end and just making sure it's monitored, looked after, and then the, uh, retrained appropriately when necessary. Yeah, and following up to that particular question, I think one of the challenges when building an ML system, for example, is that your first ML system, for example, is that when you want to scale, it literally just breaks, right? <laughs> Especially if you don't take that <laughs> scale into account, your, your stem just breaks apart. Maybe you're running a cron job and a Python script, and then you don't know how to handle, say, 50K requests, 100K requests, because all of a sudden, the business has grown, right? The, the, you're, you're beginning to see that traction, that scaling up and stuff like that. You know, how do you start thinking about scalability at the onset when building a good first MLOps system? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are, there are some choices you can make earlier to help with these things so if your problem lends you to say a batch process 
type architecture, at least some element of batch processing. Doing things like building everything around PySpark, for example, means that scalability is really a question of how much infrastructure you're willing to pay for. So um, right. I'll come back to AWS as an ex as just because it's the one I'm most familiar with, but it applies to the other cloud providers. If I use their on-cloud Spark clusters, the Elastic Map Reduce clusters, you can start putting in things like auto-scaling policies and uh, scaling up that infrastructure as and when you need it. And the fundamentals of your code don't need to change. So I think that's a decision you can make early on because I can run PySpark on my laptop. Probably not much use. It's a very small cluster, but I can also run it on a 10,000 node cluster if I have the capability to pay for it. So even little choices like that. If you think more in the microservice architecture we were talking a little bit about before, you start thinking about things like load balancers. So do you start right. bringing load balancers? Do you have the expertise for that? Do you understand how to route this traffic appropriately, the networking uh, and questions that come from that? And then are you able to spawn up the processes you need to maybe run your ML model? And then I would start leveraging things like maybe cloud functions or, or Lambda as it is in AWS. So very lightweight pieces of code that you can run in an extremely scalable fashion where you don't have to think about that underlying infrastructure. And I think, I think in general, the cloud just helps with scalability. You pay a little bit of a premium per unit, but you just sleep better at night because you know scaling is, scaling is very much easier there. So I would right. always recommend that you at least explore and understand the options available in cloud. And then if you are building in a more on-prem or local way, you at least do it in a way that you know you can port up to cloud. So the great example there is PySpark. Even if I'm running on my laptop, I build everything in PySpark, porting it up to use a very scalable cloud service later is not a big deal. Whereas it would be a big deal if I sort of written everything in vanilla Python and serial Python, and then I had to refactor for scalability. So there's some choices and thoughts you can make early on the process that, that should help, I think. Okay, we have a question in chat from Penny Johnston. Penny is asking, can you give an insight into actual timescales in the field from model ideation to solution delivery, monitoring cycles and improvements? Also, how do you manage the business expectations for these? Great question. This is this is like what my job is, <laughs> is worrying about this. So I've actually just finished a, a webinar um, on the work we've done on decreasing our time to value in that way. So I can I can mention some of the figures and things there because it's in the public domain. So typically for us, we were finding before we adopted some of the, the best practices and tooling on, on the cloud, we were roughly a year to get a model from ideation to production. Now that is long. And the, the big kind of factor there for us was being in financial services. There's a lot of governance and other things we have to go through. In, in my previous job, we were delivering a model every quarter, roughly. And I would say that's more feasible. So every few months, taking something through ideation to production. If you're talking about iterative improvements on models rather than a full, which I think Penny, you're asking about sort of the whiteboard through to a solution. Iterative improvements, I think could be sprint or sub sprint level if you've got good CI, CD practices in place. We've now been able in that way to get that down to around three months, that once a quarter level. Um, for any particular team because we invested the time, energy, and effort in building out an MLOps platform that used SageMaker and its surrounding ecosystems. But that was a case of harking back to what I mentioned before. We understood how to do the processes well first, and we understood the fundamentals and what good design looked like. It was just we upgraded everything and were able to refactor a lot of internal processes as well for that. So I'd say, I'd say for me, that kind of once a quarter piece is reasonable for most scale organizations. The scale factor comes in for larger organizations because they can do a lot in parallel. So in a smaller company, once a quarter means literally one ML model for the company. For a huge organization like NatWest or others, it might mean hundreds per quarter, but it's really per team one, one model per quarter in my view. And ML ops building, et cetera, should just be part of that process. So as long as you've got the understanding the design, the architecture in place, you should be able to also incorporate that into that, that once a quarter cycle. And that, that's just my view. I think there'll be, there'll be a million different views on this across, across the piece. Managing expectations is the fun part, right? So you've got a few challenges and hurdles you need to overcome. I think one is really making sure that your, your stakeholders, your customers, your colleagues understand the benefits of machine learning in the first place but then also understand why MLOps is important. So 
it's one thing to solve a problem using a machine learning algorithm. The next thing is to make sure you can solve it every day for the rest of time. And that's where the MLOps piece comes in. So you need to kind of win hearts and minds so that they understand why you're investing time, energy, effort, money into developing these extra bits of the solution, the monitoring capabilities, the model management pieces, et cetera. So I think you really need to do that. And then they understand why you're investing all of that and in, in those extra pieces. But again, it, it comes down to just simplifying. So making sure that they understand the basics of what you're doing and you're constantly updating them and making sure they understand when you're running into issues and where they where the bottlenecks are. That means you can then iterate on that for, for your next for your next uh, set of projects. I've had to do that many a time where we thought we'd deliver in three months and then it's taken a lot longer. But as long as you're clearly communicating with your stakeholders, they'll, they'll understand that those expectations are shifting and they'll kind of they'll buy into that, I think. It was a really great question. I think it's one of the most important challenges is stakeholder management. Yeah, for sure. It's not just about the tech stack, but sometimes it's yeah. about the people and communications and all that. We have another question from uh, Nabil Belgasmi. If we want our mod ML models to be retrained automatically on new data, what is the impact of this requirement on a simple MLOps workflow? Good question. If you want it trained on new data every single time, you've got a few things you, well, first of all, you could challenge that assumption. Do I really need it trained on new data every time? Or do I just need it trained when there's a shift in the distribution of the data or when there's a drop in performance? But, let, but let's assume, Nabil, for your question, we've settled on no when new data is in, we want to train the model. The downstream impacts on your MLOps processes and system are going to be that, okay, I've retrained the model, but what do I do with it? So what is your process for determining if it's the actual model that goes through into production? What you don't want to do is just automatically push it to production. That's the, the first kind of gotcha because it could be you've retrained it and it's really bad, it's terrible, it spits out absolute garbage, you push it to production, everything goes down. So you need some mechanism to view the performance of that newly trained model, not just the one already in production. And that's again where your model management and other tools come in. So can you track the appropriate metadata, the metrics for the training run? I think what's important as well, um, if you are thinking about pushing a specific model into production is, have you actually simulated production like conditions. So do you have a test environment set up that runs in the same way as your production model? So I, I'm actually, I missed this gotcha earlier uh, from your question, Stephen, but a gotcha I've seen a lot is data science teams will develop a model with a particular set of assumptions. They have five years of data, for example, they've done their training test validation splits, and then they think it's going to work in production. But actually in production, you get a thousand records, new records every single day, and they don't know what the fluctuation in behavior is going to be like. So I think you need to make sure that if you're going to maybe you'll retrain and then push a model into production, you have some testing that's available that shows how it will work on production like data coming in at the cadence and frequency that it will. And then underpinning all that back to the process point earlier is you need a good MLOps process in place to say, right, that's actually okay. That fits within operational risk profiles. That's under governance control, whatever the, whatever the mechanism is, but you need basically a way to say, right, okay, push the button, push it into production. Um, and I would say all of that has to be factored into what your ML ops system looks like uh, and is capable of doing. But yeah, it's a really good question. A lot of people come up against this very quickly. And I think the most important pieces there are operating or testing in some sort of production-like environment and then having a good process for saying everything's okay. I can now now push into production. Uh, so things like blue green deployments, as um, as as you might sometimes hear about, if you if you give that a Google, it talks about how you can you can run basically the two solutions in parallel, but one's in a, an air gapped environment, and then once you're happy, you just swap them around seamlessly. Uh, building in processes like that is often a, a really good MLOps practice as well. Yeah, thanks a lot. Great questions, Penny and Nabil, and back to you, Stephen. Thanks, Andy. We have another question from the MLOps community, and this time it's from Jeremy. So Jeremy says he's working on with a very early stage startup with a single model and pretty low inference volume. What's the best framework to put in place? And uh, I mean, in the old days, he'd wrap the model in the Flask API, make an image, push it to a KA cluster as part of a CICD process. But now he, and he'd have a, an Airflow script as well, though regular, though daily uh, retrain the model with new data from production. He would do some regression testing and then trigger 
uh, the build deploy process. It have uh, a data warehouse where it keeps in friends data, where it keeps in friends data to be able to run the you know performance queries and stuff like that. You know, this seems like a lot for him. You know, he's kind of thinking, what's the easiest way to to do this today? Is there like something that consolidates this entire like these very very modular parts, or you know, what's your opinion? The first thing I'm thinking is uh, Jeremy seems to know what he's talking about, which is good. <laughs> so. But I think this perfectly embodies what I mentioned earlier about learning the basics and the fundamentals first. So, so what Jeremy's mapped out there is, is all of the correct processes and the correct handovers, right? So you've got the model, how is that hosting, what infrastructures are running on, how is that all being updated? So that's all the, the Flask, the KAS, the CICD. Right. And then starting to think about Airflow, he's mentioned all the right words around regression testing, et cetera, et cetera. So th- this, this question then is about how do you then simplify and improve that moving forward so one thing i would say is look at the tooling out there to see what can take some of those pain points away for you so if you're on particularly particularly low inference volumes are you maybe able to do that as a, as a match process that's easily scheduled are you also over complicating given tools out there how the the pipelines all stick together i don't think you mentioned that too much but a great example is SageMaker. so AWS SageMaker is their MLOps tool, but it also provides really good, strong opinionated guidance on writing good pipelines. Um, an open source thing that does a very similar thing is ZenML. So there's there's a lot of tooling out there that maybe will simplify some of the development activities he's doing. And then in terms of the KAS cluster, which is really about the hosting, you can start thinking again about if, if you were in SageMaker, for example, that takes care of the hosting and the underlying infrastructure for you. You can put in scaling policies. So there are solutions out there that take away some of that pain for you. But it sounds like he's got all the right pieces in place. It's just about maybe now moving on to that question of what particular bit should I should I invest the time and effort in optimizing? So right. I'm not sure, because Jeremy's maybe not on, but I'm not sure where the particular pain point is, if it's really scaling out that Flask API, maybe move away from a Flask API, SageMaker endpoint, or some other tooling that provides a similar way to host the model is a good idea. Could you do it all in a cloud function or a, an AWS Lambda? Actually, it keeps all the rest of the pieces, but actually you've got really vast scalability because it's a, it's a very simple SQLearn model. You could host that in an AWS Lambda very easily. So there's, I think he has to be strategic about what pieces he solves, but there are a lot of tools mm-hmm. uh, and capabilities out there that will help now that he's got that fundamental design piece in place. So now I'm okay with tooling. I know before I poo-pooed it, but <laughs> um, I think he's got the, the fundamental design in place. So you can now iterate and find the open source and, and paid for tooling that will solve some of these problems. Right. And we have another question from the MLOPS community, this time from Fatima. And she asks, well, what are the challenges they are going to face if they want to shift uh, an SME, a small or medium scale enterprise from level zero MLOps, that's their typical Google reference, level zero MLOps to level, yep. say, one or two MLOps, say, end to end automation, for example, and so like So they, they have a very basic system which works manually, but then they want yep. to move like things to like automate the end to end pipeline. You know, what are the challenges they're going to face? Yeah, no, this is, this is good. I like this because I, I referenced the same maturity model in, in my job. So that's good. Um, so a big, a big piece of that is kind of inherent in the question is automation versus the manual piece, as you, as you put it, Stephen. So for me, that is a question of orchestration and CICD practices. So right. how do you orchestrate the different processes you're, you're going to need? So I'm, I'm assuming you've went through level zero and you've done that work we mentioned earlier where you've got you've went through the processes end to end the first time maybe similar to jeremy's question you know how to solve all of these in principle what you're now moving to is to do it in a really scalable fashion so for it to be automated it needs to all be orchestrated in a way that's very safe if a component fails and mm-hmm. also one yeah. that you can monitor quite successfully so so all of that needs to come together uh, and then i think back to nabil's question quite nicely earlier as you start thinking what's triggering the automated process and how are you doing that triggering? Is it off, off of a Kafka topic or is it off of right. uh, a drift in your, in your monitoring metrics? Or is it, is it still off a manual process? Because you could, you could automate a lot of stuff but still have a manual person pulling the trigger, pushing the button at the beginning. Sometimes that's good if you have specific requirements for 
risk uh, and control behaviors, governance behaviors, like we do in financial services. Sometimes it's important to have a human in that process. So it's not completely automated, but it's pretty much I'm happy, go, and then everything's automated. So I think the key things that will move the needle uh, for you, Fatima, are those orchestration questions, the triggering questions, and then the CICD questions as well. That will help you move towards a more continuous and automated way of iterating your solution. Cool. And uh, we have one final question from the community. And this person asks, should I worry about the reliability of my ML system when building it at an early stage? Since my use case is mission critical, i.e. I'm currently building an ML product for the healthcare industry. Yes. So should you care about the reliability of your MLOps system? Absolutely. Because, oh, sorry, if you don't have a reliable MLOps system, how do you know you have a reliable ML system full stop. So I think in a mission critical scenario like this, uh, and I've not worked in healthcare, but I worked in for a distributed energy provider before where mm -hmm. we were building models that would detect if a generator would catch fire. So I'd call that mission critical as well. What we found was that again, pulling it back to the very simplest, most basic and robust things we wanted to track really helped because then what you can do is work very closely with uh, the people with the domain knowledge and your, your business colleagues to really understand what are the one or two metrics that we absolutely must track. And I think that helps with reliability because you're not going to build a super complex ML ops system, right? You're not going to build something with 10 million lines of code that's doing a hundred thousand different metrics. You're going to just focus in on the one or two that's absolutely critical to know this system is performing and is doing things in the right way. And then I think you need to make sure that you're checking in on that MLOps system as well. So the MLOps system is there to monitor your ML system, but how, how do you get a view of how everything is performing? And to me, that comes naturally from just having an MLOps system, because if you're going to look at the results of your MLOps processes, either in a dashboard or some other database that you're querying, just the act of doing that is you checking that your MLOps system is working. Yeah. So I think uh, you should worry about the reliability of it, but the main thing that will help you reduce the worry is simplifying it down to the, the key metrics, the key KPIs, and just building the minimum viable product that, that does that robustly and then testing the hell out of it. So make sure you test it until you've broken it in a million different ways. And you're very happy that the small minimum viable product will not break. Then, then you're good to go. I think no matter the domain. Awesome. Great. Thanks. So it's time to wrap things up, right? We are running out of time, although I'm sure there would have been, uh, a lot more we would have loved to pick Andy's right. brain about. But uh, thank you so much, Andy. It was great to have you um, and share your solid practical tips for our practitioners. And you really demystified MLOps, <laughs> at least for me. So thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, everyone. And uh, thanks as well to uh, everyone who asked questions. Good stuff. So before we wrap it up, Andy, how can people follow what you're doing online and maybe connect with you? If you want. Uh, yep. So you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, just search Andy McMahon. You'll hopefully work out which one it is. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Electric Ouija, which is E-L-E-C-T-R-I-C-W-E-E-G-I-E. -E -E. Um, I also have a a website, a blog that I've not updated in a while, which is electricwg.com. Um, and then finally, you can follow and subscribe to the AI Right podcast. It's on Spotify, Acast, or wherever you get your podcasts. And then you'll hear me, Megan Stamper, who's one of the heads of uh, machine learning at the BBC, and uh, Chris McFadgen, who's uh, someone I know very well who does a lot of recruitment. You'll hear us talk about the Scottish tech scene, if that's your particular interest. But we talk about lots of really cool stuff in ML and MLOps there as well. So that, those are the main places to find me. Right. So plenty of channels to run into you. Uh, right. So this also comes out as a podcast in, uh, in a couple of weeks. So you can catch up with this episode and other past episodes on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or yeah, wherever you get get your podcasts uh, we'll be back in two weeks on august 3rd and next time our guest will be adam Schraka. we'll be talking about building an mlops culture on your team so more people stuff coming up but in the meantime we'll see you guys on socials and in the mlops community slack there is an invite link in the chat if you want to use it and uh, make sure to hop into the neptune ai channel while you're at it you can post questions there both in advance and after uh, our episodes. 
if there was something that you didn't have a chance to ask during the episode. So thanks once again to everyone and take care. See you soon. Bye bye. Yeah, bye everyone. Yeah. MOOPS Live is brought to you by Neptune AI. Remember that you can join us live at the next event and ask your questions. And you can register at neptune.ai slash events. And then make sure to search for MLOps Live in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Click follow and don't miss any episodes. Thanks and see you next time.